Hello, guys. Yeah, my voice is kind of worn out, uh, but I hope you can bear with me and be kind and kind enough. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, today I have a broad. I I when I was preparing this sermon, I just could feel. Uh, how would spirit would feel by looking at our church, by looking at the church itself in in Korea, and um, this was this was just given um, through my expository sermon. Um, it was the right stage, but it just on the right point and on the right time. So I just I'm thrilled to share this with you. Um, you know, have you ever? been to a stage when you feel it's so much better to not be the Christians <laughs> because if you if we just don't believe we can do stuff that Christians are not to do <laughs> without a guilt we can do we can do the things and it seems like it can feel like it can free us even by just not being a Christians um, it seems like things will be so much easier if we just lived in our ways. Uh, and even if we operate in world's way, we still compare it to the people um, and always not content in what we, who we are. So what Christians should do is instead of looking at the premise of our life, there is so much premise of where we are in, like our circumstances, our situations, who we are and who, who I am right now as a social class, who I am um, in a walk with God, but who I am, but still, those are the premise. But when we focus on the premise, it always makes us depressed. <laughs> um, Discomfortable, uh, co not comfortable, uncomfortable. Uh, but as a believers, we have something better than the premise that we're in, which is the promise of God. And that's the hope that we have. And if you're struggling with the premise that you're in today, I hope that you're encouraged and challenged by God's promise and be um, content where we are right now. So we've been following the story of Abraham, and we, just last week, we went to the story of 99-year-old Abraham, who finally got his name correct, um, because I always make mistakes uh, by pronouncing Abraham when he was Abraham, uh, but fi he finally got a new name, Abraham, and we had to ask ourselves, why now? Why at this point, he's given a new name? Uh, Abram, which means the honorable father, can be fulfilled by just saying, uh, by just having Isaac. But God changed his name to Abraham to, so, to let him know that whatever that you are, Abraham means the father of nation. So whatever you're hoping and dreaming for, what you're gonna, you say you're going to be complete. When you have the Isaac, you can, have, you can be the honorable father just by having Isaac. But Isaac is just the beginning of the things that I'm going to do with you. It's just a starting point of, the, of my covenant and starting point of my will to fulfill. That's why at that point, God reaffirms his covenant for the third time, but also changes his name to Abraham. And as a sign of that covenant, before that he didn't need any signs, but this time... As a mature Christians, he needed the sign of that covenant. But for as a sign, Abraham was required to be circumcised, right? And we are similarly required to, um, as a sign of your salvation, we are baptized. And we shared about three things, how you die to yourself and you're being newborn. And it's a sign of the promise, not requirement of your salvation, and today we'll pick up where we left off last week and see what happened next. 
and we're not going to go that far. So we're going to actually get really deep into it. So, so God changes Sarah's name, Sarah's name into Sarah, and he promised indicating, indicating that the son will come through her next year. So that's where we left off. And let's read Genesis 17, 17. <clears throat> so he's got that promise, you're going to have a son. But this is where Abraham fell face down. So let's read this together, shall we? Abraham fell face down. He left and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? So he said he fell face down, but also he left. So we got to think, what does this left mean? Because the Bible doesn't say if this left was the positive left or the negative left. But we can kind of assume what manner he left, in what manner he left through the next verse. But um, we, he knew, he knew for sure the promise was impossible given the premise that he was in. Because he's 99 years old, Sarah is at the age of 89 so far, but he, she was about to be 90 years old. So he may have thought to himself that God was just saying this, something kind, so that he can comfort him, you know? So Abram only takes God's promise as, you know, face, face value. But that's why he tells stories like this in verse 18. And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. So we can clearly know in what tone he left. You know, I, God said, I'm going to give you a son. And he's like, God, if only Ishmael li might live under your blessings. So Abraham, Abraham asks for the most realistic prayer that he can do. He can pray. Regarding his premise to look. So he thinks of his premise that he's in. And with his mind and with his understanding and with his logic, he can pray the things that he can pray in the most humanistic and realistic ways. This is the prayer, if only Ishmael. Because Ishmael was already born. He was 13 years old. And he's looking at his premise. He's praying this. If only Ishmael might live under your blessings, God. I don't, I don't even need that far because it seems impossible to me given the premise of where I am. So I know I'm thankful for your promise, but this is my prayer, God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessings. Isn't this often the case with us? Because the best promises God will fulfill seems impossible in our understandings. The promise that are given through the book of the Bible seems illogical. It doesn't make sense. With all my own mind and my intuition, it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to work. So what we end up is that we pray only for the things that are most likely to come true, that make most sense of our premise. You see, Ishmael, was the son that God would bless, but it was not the son that God promised. Be because the son that God promised was actually promised before Ishmael came, right? Ishmael was the result of man's way of trying to accomplish God's will in his own strength. He did his best with the premise that he had according to fulfill God's will. And that's what Ishmael was. But Isaac, who is now to come, is the result of complete God's grace. It, it, not of man's way, but God's way alone. There is no human way to be involved 
that only God can do this because he's a sovereign God. So even more, the promise of Isaac was made before Ishmael, but we ended up doing the things that can make most sense of our way, and then we begin to have Ishmael. But God is giving another time. Yeah, you did, you did find your own way, but I'm still going to do my way because I'm the God. I'm going to make it possible. What Ishmael did was Ishmael brought division and conflict in Abraham's household. But Isaac will be the one who brings the joy and hope to that household. Ishmael belongs to man's way, but Isaac belongs to God's way. But the reality is that we're still seeking the things of this world. We're thinking about what to eat and what to wear. And we only pray for the things that can make sense and actually can come true with our logics, with our understandings. So Jesus says in this way, Matthew 6.31, when he teaches people how to pray, he says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Because in verse 32, he says, for the pagans run after all these things. So even the unbelievers can pray for those things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. In verse 33, he says, but seek First, what? His kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you, will be given to you as well. But for us, looking at our premise, it's really hard to pray and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. <laughs> because we have to shift our focus to God's promise for us to pray for his kingdom and his righteousness. So what Jesus is saying don't pray for the things that can mo make most sense of your understanding. Pray for what God promised through the word, what God promised through the truth. So stop seeking, seeking the things of the world, but start seeking my will and my righteousness and my kingdom, which I can only accomplish. There was a, so much of the insights um, that happened to me. I wanted to share this a lot, uh, so I had to wait for uh, until this time. So two weeks ago, I had a privilege to having a tea time with Sophia's dad, and uh, he, 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 her dad was the, one of the first to experience the revival that happened in Bolivia back in 1970. So it was so inspiring to hear him talk about it because in, within my heart, I wanted the revival to come again uh, among the younger generations of these days. But he said, uh, uh, while having a conversation with him, God buried this story in the history of Christianity for over 50 years. And nobody talked about the revival that happened in Bolivia. And then in God's timing, how people were actually wondering about, people started to finding out about the revival. So Sophia's dad felt the need to write a book about it, and I'm still reading it. Ever since I've been grabbing that book, it was, I was enjoying it, Sophia. And he wrote a book. And by some coincidence, in this season, I got the book from her, and I'm reading it. And then, uh, and even that, like even in that, like what is really amazing is how the guy who wrote the book was Sophia's dad, and how Sophia came to our church was like out of nowhere because she is young ones. Young one is a uh, missionary kid in Bolivia. So he happened to walk down the road and he just, you know, Sophia just happened to ask young one of direction and young one just kind of saw Sophia. I was like, 
she's, she looks like she speaks Spanish. So she's like, do you speak Spanish, right? <laughs> this is a real thing. So, so uh, Sophia was amazed and then how they were all connected uh, within the Bolivia. And she was, uh, she was Bolivian that lived in U.S. And which at the time she came, so they talked about the church. I don't know how they talked about the church within that street. Um, but she was looking for a church and she came uh, a week after that. And then Youngwon left <laughs> for a few weeks, a few months. But Sophia started to come every week. That, at that time, we had like at, at most five people attending that service. But she still kept coming, and I, I really appreciated it. But she started to come in every week, and her dad happened to be the writing a book about revival. And he came to Korea, and he saw me, and he said, you know, he said, he, I, I, Spirit strongly told me to share this story with you. And so we had a tea time. So the reason I say this out of the blue, because of this, he gave us some great insights about the revival. And... We pray for the revival, and we do everything in our power to bring it out. We look at how many conferences and retreats that says about this is the revival, but revival actually never came. But we have to recognize that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity, and it has a will. But we, so many times what we end up doing is that we use, we don't treat Holy Spirit as a person, we use it as a tool. So we do in our ways and we prepare our plans for the revival of this generation as if we are praying for Ishmael in our ways. In John 3, 8, it says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, you, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So it's saying, Spirit is like a wind. It can come. We don't direct where the wind blows. He has a will to blow wherever it pleases. So what we need to do... Just as the wind blows wherever it pleases, the Holy Spirit has his own will and will show things that cannot happen through human understanding and human logic. And that's what exactly was happening in Bolivia as I was reading a book. I was seeing so many wonderful stories that I can't share right now for sake of the time. But that's the, if you look at the revival throughout the history, because I studied a lot about the revival, it happened all in the same because the Pyongyang, in where, where we had a revival in Korea back in 1907, no one predicted it, uh, predicted it. And when I was in the middle school, they said, oh, 2007. Uh, so there was someone who was born in 2007. They said in 2007, they said this is the 100th year of the revival that happened in Pyongyang. So what we did, we opened up the huge conference calling it this is the commemoration of the revival and hoping to ha happen again. And what happened? Korean churches started to decline <laughs> from then. I'm not saying that caused it, but it didn't make the revival to happen. Asbury Revival, we talked about it. We have seen some of the things uh, from last year how the, the, they, the, there were the revival that happened in Asbury College. But um, where I went to college is actually started from the graduates of Asbury um, University. Um, so I studied a lot that happened in the first revival that happened in 1970. So in 1970, there was a revival that happened in Asbury. And that revival, no one predicted it. It just came out of the blue. And... <clears throat> It was just people started to coming. And you know what happened? 50 years later, 2020, so they did, they wanted to open another revival service. They did, like, let's commemorate this. And then they did 50th anniversary, uh, well, the revival. So they tried to open that thing up. You know what happened? COVID came. The revival couldn't happen. But 2023, within three years, no one knew out of the chapel services. 
of normal days, six people gathered to pray. Six college young girls gathered to pray after the sermon in that chapel. And then the, the presence of God was so heavy, it couldn't contain. The 24, uh, for 19 days, 24-7, nonstop worshiping happened within that campus. And thousands of Americans, thousands of the people, even from people in the, um, South America, flew to Asbury to experience what was actually going on. Well, I'm not saying that is it, but I'm just saying you cannot make Holy Spirit as a tool because he's a person and it, pl it flows wherever it pleases. This is some of the insights that he gave me and it just shocked me because we pray for the so many Ishmael kind of prayers and we just try to plan it out. We try to do in our ways, in the best ways. Oh, this is in the best time for our, us. But revival never happens within. His promise never happens within us, our plans. But only by his grace, which is Isaac's. The so question is, what kind of faith are we stepping out in for this promise, Isaac, in front of us? So if we look at our current premise, we only end up with Ishmael. But when, I, when we look at the promise of God, we, folk, we shift our focus to see what God is going to do. We see Isaac instead. So what, God, what does God say? Genesis 17, 21. He makes it for sure. But my covenant will be established with Isaac, not Ishmael. So whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. So he tells exact time. And so finally God tells Isaac exactly when he will be born. And... They waited for the 25 years to have the baby. Now, finally, the moment that they were waiting is about to be fulfilled. So it, the chapter 18 brings us to the day of that moment. So it was Abraham, Abraham was 99 years old in chapter 17. But now Abraham is 100 years old, which is the promised time. So there is one year of gap from chapter 17 through 18. So chapter 18 brings us to the day of that moment. Verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. And while he was sitting at the entrance of to his tent in the heat of the day. Once again, God himself comes to Abraham to fulfill God's plan. It wasn't Abraham going to God. He came. It was his will, and it was his job to make it happen. So Isaac is a child of God's promise, not of man's idea or man's methods. So the place where God comes to Abraham is, you know, ever the, the great trees of memory. And this place is actually the place where Abraham worshipped God for the first time and built an altar there in chapter 12. So, that's where God appears to Abraham again. And chapter 18, verse 2, it says, Abraham looked up and saw great three men standing nearby. He starts seeing. So, my question is this. When he looked at them, those three guys, how in the world did he know that they were God's promised ones? So he didn't know. So <clears throat> when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent. So he was eager to meet them, though. So verse 1, it says they were, he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. So it wasn't like he was like chilling, chilling out, and then the people just came by. Oh, hey, come on, come on in. Like, and let's chill out. It, it wasn't like that. He was very eager to have them. He was sitting at the entrance. 
maybe because God told him the exact time and he knew that it was about to happen. So got his time. So he was sitting there. And he saw them. He just had to know that this was God sent one. My question is how? How did Abraham had those eyes and had those sensitivity to know that it's actually God's plan? Because we always try to figure out if this is God's way or my way. or Is this really Isaac or Ishmael? Because we always, we pray with, there's like a thing, my like thoughts that pops in our head. Like, is this God's revelation or is this just one of my thoughts? Like, we always struggle with that, right? But Abraham somehow just knew. How many people would, would have passed by his territory? But he just knew. The three guys came and just knew, oh, that's the one. And he said, verse 3, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. He just, can't, he just saw him for the first time. He just knew. Let a little water be brought. Then you may all wash your feet and rest under his tree. So it's unusual for Abraham. Not, he doesn't just receive the strangers, but he actively shows his hospitality to them. He had this sensitive spirit. and He saw the presence of God right at the moment. We want to hear God's voice. We want to see God's presence. We want to follow his lead. But our question is, how? How? And this is where I tell you that one ear gap has to step in. Because Bible doesn't mention anything about how chapter 17 went through chapter 20 and what Abraham did during that time. It comes from intimacy with God. When you are intimate with someone, you just know. You just know. This is intimacy. I believe, I don't know, Bible doesn't clearly say it, but I believe Abraham just, did, just didn't wait, it, but he pursued it. I think he praised and he worshiped God with to build the intimacy for him to have that sensitivity to grab the chance to have to serve the one who is about to come you know god calls abraham his friend how dare you are friend of god but god calls abraham you see in isaiah 41 he says but you israel my servant jacob whom, whom i have chosen your descendant of abraham but abraham comma and says my friend so Abraham is a hobby, my friend. So God is considering Abraham as his friend. The level of intimacy that Abraham had in some other level of that we can expect. The level of intimacy invited God's presence and made it possible to serve with joy. You know, I just could see the verse just by reading uh, verse 18. Uh, chapter 18, verse 2 and 4, through and 4, two, 2 through 4, says, I just could see his joy, like joy of serving. Like he's like, let me serve you. Like he's, he's doing this, like he's, he can't keep himself. He, he wants to, be, he's somehow full with joy. Our worship should be joyful. And where does this joy come from? You know, this joy and this intimacy doesn't just come if you just come to, church, come to church once a week and just close your eyes. This is not the level of intimacy it's talking about. You know, you, you would only invite people inside of your house to the one you are very, you think that you're close with, right? If we are not that close, it's, it's really weird and awkward to invite you in. But I'm just fine to let you hang out at the, my front porch. And then I'll just go. But you know that's how, how we are treating God these days? We treat God as God is knocking at our doors every day. But we are like, oh, God, I have my time. I'll be right there. 
stay on that porch. Don't come in. I'm right there at the right time when I want it. That's not intimacy. If you're really intimate, if you're really friend with God, if you're really close to God in your relationship with Him, you can't wait to have Him inside. This is what Abraham is doing. In the military, I went to military uh, for two years. And this is not something proud of uh, because it's mandatory. And when the division commander comes to visit, this is what we would do. All the soldiers panic. They start cleaning up all the living quarters, starting with the barrack, even down to the smallest area in the bathroom. They, they have to do that. And that's why they're afraid when the division commander comes to their barrack. And let's say... Because he's, he's our commander. We're not that close to him. So come, like, him coming to us is always a source of fear. <laughs> but let's say if that commander is your father, you would not be worried, right? It's your dad. It doesn't matter who you are. And let's say our God is coming, and if you're not very intimate with God himself, your reception of God becomes a frightening event for you because his holiness only would make your sin come out and stand out. But when I become intimate with God, it doesn't matter. So verse 3 says, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Do not pass me by. That will be a perfect heart hymn as well. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. This is what we should do as a Christians, because if we um. We say we're close to God at church, but at home, we're closer to him. Uh, we're, we're not as close as, as we say at home, uh, at, at church. We don't want God to come into our personal home and our personal life. God is knocking at our doors. See, what I'm seeing on the front, there is a condition that Abraham needed to fulfill the promise of Isaac. There's a condition that Abraham need, needed to have in order for him to have that promise to come true. There's a condition we need to have in order to fulfill God's promise over our premise. And that's what intimacy is all about. By this time, in one year, I don't know what he did, but he was for sure very intimate enough, very sensitive enough to recognize who he is and, to, and he was ready enough to do wherever he wants to do. So we no longer live by looking at premise over our Ishmael's, but by looking to the promise Isaac got is for us. When God built this church, he gave us great promise. We wanted to fulfill God's kingdom. We wanted to be the haven for the foreigners. We wanted to be the haven for the younger generations. We have a great vision, great promise that has, had, God has given to this church. But for that to happen, ladies and gentlemen, we, there's a condition that we need to build up. God wants to use the one who is very close to him, who is very intimate with him. And to do that, I believe this is a time for us as the member of this church 
to actively seek out to um to find and to seek out God's will. So our church has several ways to fulfill that, but I would strongly encourage you guys to attend Wednesday night service, a prayer night prayer service and the fr- Friday um prayer uh, house of prayer. We just what we do is that there's no sermon, we just um play music, we just uh, sing, we just uh, sing praises, and we just pray at the same time. But it, this is all doing so that we want to help you to build the intimacy with God so that you can spend time with God. It's nothing out of, you know, we're doing this in a religious ways, but I just want you to guys to build the intimacy with God and eyes to see what God is wanting to do. So you can come to the services because there's no sermon. You can just read your Bible with the music going on. You can do your own devotions. But it's because it's really hard to do devotions by yourself. So just why don't you just make yourself here and then just do it? That will really help you. And what I hope is that we don't do just open those services on Wednesday and Friday. We want to have it have it like every day. Um, but the things uh, for future goal, but all the goals in doing that is so that we can have and we can build our intimacy with God. How are you doing and how, what are you praying these days? Are you only praying for the Ishmael thing, the premise? Can the worst thing come? Or are you praying for the promise God will show you. When we are used to just praying for our premise and then coming up with all the prayer requests that can only be solved with human agenda and with human understanding, that's all we're going to get. And remember that that's the same prayer that pagans would pray. They can pray for the same things. But what makes Christians distinctive from other religions is that they don't come up with their own prayer request and make it happen. They have their promise through the word of God. And with the faith, they pray for that promise. That's, that's why it was, it's able for Christians to not to look at the premise that they're in, but shift their focus to look the promise. But in order for you to do that, in order for God to fulfill his will through your life, is to build the intimacy. There's a condition that we need to have so that God wants to use your life. Something beautiful and something good according to His will. So young people, I think it's our our time. You're college finished, so you have free times. Amen? So I just encourage you to just come. Like, spend your time here. Like, you can do, you can come, you can go to cafeteria and do whatever you want, but just come here. There's a a coffee right here. Hang out with your friends here. Just have some prayer time. And then just go out in the lobby. I think it's just all about having the intimacy, not only with the church, but with God himself. Starting your day, ending your day by spending time in the Word and by praying. And that all builds your sensitivity to know who he is. Your sensitivity to know what God's leading you into. And this is a perfect hymn. Nearer, my God, to Thee. Nearer, my God, my to Thee, nearer to Thee. I think this is to be the prayer we need to pray. Till all my song shall be nearer my God to thee. Yet in my dreams I'll be nearer my God to thee. Angels to beckon me nearer my God to thee. Nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee. So by my woes to be nearer my God to be. Nearer my God to thee, nearer my God to thee. Still all my song shall be nearer my God to thee. Nearer, my God, to Thee, nearer to Thee. I think this would be what Abraham must have prayed during those years. God, I want to know when your time is. 
God, I want to do, I want to be ready when that time comes. I don't know when, but you know when. So let me be the one. So remember the Peter when he was experiencing the Pentecost, the pour over of his spirit. No one expected it, but they were praying without knowing when. They just knew he would come someday. So 120 people in that attic, they prayed. Well, I'm thankful it, it happened in 10 days, but they didn't know. It could have been 10 years and 100 years. But what they were doing for them to receive the revival in their heart was to build the intimacy with God by praying in the attic by themselves. Oh, God, let me be near to thee. Every time I go, I want to do and I want to be part of your God. You will, God. Let me be your friend. Let me build this intimacy. Guys, intimacy is not just having friendship. Actually, intimacy is the relationship you would have your wife with your husband. This is the level of intimacy we need to have. God, I want you. I want myself to be drawn near to you. And the Bible says, if we draw near to God, He will draw near to us. This is the truth. Let's pray.